everybody, this is Tracy here for another edition of A View from Tracy's Point, and we are here to recap 911 Season 1, Episode 5, which was titled Points of Origin. <laughs> So the show opens up with an Indian couple and they're preparing for their marriage and it turns out to be an arranged uh, marriage. And so they're experiencing the typical wedding jitters <laughs> before the ceremony, which I guess is magnified by 10 because it is an arranged marriage and it's not like they met each other and fell in love. So things seem to be going well with the ceremony and they move on to the reception and everybody's dancing and having a good time and then all of a sudden the floor collapses underneath them and they just drop and I think Bobby said that they dropped two floors and so 16 people you know were dead by the time the paramedics got there and they said that one had been impaled which means that something like a board or pole or something went through them and um, the bride, they couldn't get to her. So, you know, they had to cut through the rubble and everything. But she ended up being okay. She wasn't injured or anything when they were finally able to pull her out. But then Bobby goes after the owner of the building because he, as he was going through the rubble, he realized that the guy didn't use like um, rebarb or anything to level out the floor and to strengthen um, the floor because it was actually a two-story building and he added a third floor but he built the third floor on top of the roof but he didn't do anything to solidify it or strengthen it or anything so he was going at the guy and the guy you know he was like I'm sorry I'm sorry he didn't know so then I think Henrietta had to come over and like pull him back like you can't be all up in that man business because he was telling the guy you know you're going to jail for this and you're going to do time and I was like Bobby chill out but then we would learn later on in the show exactly why he was so emotional and reacted the way that he did. So Athena and Henrietta they meet for drinks and I guess a bite to eat and <laughs> so she shares um, with so Henrietta shares with Athena like how weirded out she is about Bobby and the fact that they don't know anything about him and she tells about how they had in the last episode where they went to his house and it just looked like nobody lived there like he was just you know, there. <laughs> you know, there was no pictures on the wall. It was furniture that looked like, you know, when he first moved in, the furniture was already there and he decided to keep it. So um, uh, Athena says, well, you know, if you want, I can run a background check on him and find out. But Henrietta says she doesn't want to do that. You know, she wants him to open up in his own time, but she is starting to get a little concerned. So we learned in this episode, and I don't think anybody was really surprised because in my first i think my first recap i said that um henrietta would probably turn out to be gay and her and athena would probably have an affair after athena found out that her man was gay but that's not the case well henrietta is gay but we find out that she has an ex-girlfriend who's in prison and that they have a son that they i don't know if they adopted him or one of them gave birth to him but anyway there's a little boy involved and so the ex-girlfriend wants to see Henrietta but Henrietta doesn't know how to tell her current wife <laughs> that the ex-wife want to see her so I guess gay people be having the same issues as straight people so the ex um so then Henrietta finally decides that she, to go to the prison and see the girl and why they got Henrietta like dressed straight up like a butch dude like <laughs> You know, like very masculine with the lumber, a lumberjack plaid shirt on, some blue jeans. I was just like, what y'all do here really like that? But anyway, she goes see the ex and the ex looks like a straight up strung out meth head. <laughs> so she was a white woman, looked like she'd been tricking and conniving all her life. And she's up for parole and she wants um, Henrietta to vouch for her at her parole hearing. And she asks Henrietta, could she come wearing her uniform? to get some authenticity to, to 
um, her presence being there. And so Athena, not Athena, so Henrietta was like, you know, I don't know. I got to talk to my woman and see what she's saying. And you could, and you could tell that she kind of like still have feelings for the woman. But on the other hand, you sit there like, why were you ever attracted to her? I mean, she had like cornrows in her head and everything. And I said, now she just looked like she a hustler, been a hustler, gonna always be a hustler. So here we are, you might want to leave her where she at and don't be vouching for her to get out of jail. Because once they help her get out of jail, she gonna wreak havoc in your life. Later, we have a scene with Henrietta and the current wife. And I can't remember what show she's played on before, but I have seen her in other uh, television shows. And she's an African-American woman. And she senses that something is going on. And then she finally um, realizes that Henry Eva has gone to see the ex-wife. And I think the ex-wife name was Eva. And so she's like, you know, what does she want? And she tells her. And so she's looking at her like... Um, I don't think that's a good idea. And she tells Henrietta that she still, I think she said that she still has feelings for the woman or that she was really in love with the woman and it was a hard breakup. And so you can tell that new, the new wife has trust issues and she ain't really feeling Eva and she want Eva to stay over there where she at. And I'm thinking Eva needs to stay over there for the sake of their relationship. Then we had some shenanigans with Buck and Abby in this episode. And I don't know about y'all, but I'm just really not feeling Buck and Abby hooking up at all. So Buck calls Abby after getting a text, you know, so she had text about the mother being missing. And so she breaks down as the two talk about the mom and, you know, trying to find the mom. And she says that it's been eight hours and no sign of her. So Buck says, you know, he's on his way. So when Buck gets there, Carla answers the door. So she's excited, you know, when Buck shows up, you know, but Abby's trying to be all business, letting them know, you know, this is the plan. We done came up. These are the calls we done made. You know, she's being all official. So they devise a plan to search for Patricia. So while I looking for Patricia, uh, Buck jokes that this is technically their first date. And Abby says that uh, she hasn't had sex in a year. And so then they get to talking and he's like, you mean you ain't did nothing? Like you don't pleasure yourself? You don't use toys? I'm like, boy, is that really any of your business? So Abby says that, you know, she just don't feel sexy, you know, knowing that her mom is in the dining room dying. Because y'all know Patricia, um, I don't know if Patricia moved in with Abby. Is that why she don't have a bedroom? But like they took the dining room into her bedroom. So she like right there. So whether you're in the living room or the kitchen or wherever, uh, Patricia is there watching. So a call comes in over the scanner about a three-year-old that's trapped in the swimming pool. I think somebody ran into a power line and the power line fell over into these people's yard. And so when they decide that they're going to go, you know, they can get there quicker than the paramedics are going to get there. So they go over to these people's house. And so they assess the situation and we see the little girl. She's in a, a floating device, you know, like a duck or something. And then there's a, was it a duck or was it a slice of pizza? I can't remember what it was, but she was floating in something. And there was a guy in the pool that was dead. And I really couldn't figure out, like, if that was the dad in the swimming pool, if that was, uh, I don't know who was in that swimming pool, but it was a lady in the back, you know, in the backyard that was all hysterical. And then the guy that met them out on the street he comes in and then he's like, he's going to go in the pool and get the little girl. So they was trying to explain to him, no, there's like, you know, all this voltage from the power line running through the water and you'll get electrocuted. So him and um, Buck get into it. So Buck, you know, finally getting to come to his senses. So then Buck grabbed this um, shark. It was like a shark float. <laughs> so he said he was going to go get the girl. And Abby was like, oh, you can't do that. That ain't going to work. Because if you touch the water, then you're going to get electrocuted. So she comes up with the idea to take the water hose and they threw the water hose across the pool and then Buck went on the other side and got one in and then they hooked it on the girl and then they kind of like drug her to the edge of the pool and got her out of the pool. And then after they, you know, rescued the little girl, then the paramedics showed up and said that they had contacted the power company and the power company had cut the power. <laughs> so 
I don't know how realistic that scene was, but we're going to go with it. So now they're feeling, you know, energized and the adrenaline is pumping and Bob, um, Buck tells Abby, you know, let's go find your mom now. So my question was at that point was, had they issued a silver alert on Patricia? <laughs> like y'all little bit riding on the highway and they had those signs up and it'll say silver alert. Well, the silver alerts for the old people and for people who are missing, like you could be a teenager but have like mental illness or some kind of disability that will keep you from getting home safely. So I haven't seen a silver alert or heard a silver alert go out on Patricia. <laughs> but then lo and behold, they get a phone call that Patricia at the hospital. It turns out that these three Latino, I don't know if they was Latino or Asian, but anyway, they look like some gang members from South Central. <laughs> so they done found uh, Patricia and brought her to the hospital. And the one guy said that his grandmama had Alzheimer's. So he recognized the signs. And then, you know, he told um, Abby, you know, you better just be prepared because it's just going to get progressively worse. But we wish you luck. <laughs> it's just like... Okay, y'all really stretching it on this episode. So after that, you know, Buck was trying to get his um breaks. So after all, you know, their day together and you know all the adventures, Buck was trying to get his rap on. But then Abby said after the second thought, you know, she didn't think this is gonna work out that they should just be friends. And so Buck seemed a little upset because you know he was used to you know when he saved the day the women give up the draws <laughs> but abby wasn't doing that after she done broke the man hard and you know hurt his feelings and everything she had there tell him now don't go um get some girl off a of tinder and have sex with her <laughs> so i'm like abby you don't know how the game work you just the dog became buck new challenge so now he got to step up his game and come up with a way that he gonna get in your draws because you just made it that much more interesting and you done told the man that you had sex in a year oh yeah he coming for you girl so when it's all said and done buck i think is gonna hit that before the end of the season so then we move over to bobby and there was a scene with bobby where he's at a church and he's talking to a priest and he says that he's afraid to share the story with his team about his life. And then the priest was telling them, well, you know, if they're your friends, you should be able to talk to them. You know, what's the big deal? And then Bobby turned to the man and said he murdered his family. <laughs> it was just like, okay. Now, I know in my last recap, I said I thought Bobby's family was dead and he probably couldn't save them. But I wasn't expecting Bobby to say that he killed the people. So then we get a flashback scene from five years in the past. And so Bobby was drinking, but tries to cover it up with some mouthwash. And so he goes into the house. I think he had just gotten off of work. So he goes in the house and, you know, and the kids run up to him. They're happy to see him and everything. So then the wife comes up, you know, she's like, well, you know, where have you been? Why are you late? So he said he got to go get the kids ready for bed. So they were in the bathroom and the kids were brushing their teeth and he was sitting on the toilet and then he kind of like dozed off. And so the kids woke him up. So then the little girl, she was so precious, but she had jokes and she was like, I can't even remember. She was like, where's the best place? What did she say? Where's the best place to have a fire? The fire station. Where's the best place you know, she was just saying these stupid things. Like, I should have wrote them down. You know, what's the best car to have an accident in? An ambulance. You know, just saying little stupid stuff like that. Where's the best place to to commit a crime in a police station? You know, just being silly. So then the little, then he put the kids to bed. And then the little boy, you know, asked him about his bike pain. You know, he said, I can tell that you're still in pain. And, you know, he told the little boy that he was okay. You know, he just had a long day. So then he goes out and he's in the living room talking with the wife. And so he tells the wife that, you know, he needs to go for a walk and stretch his back out because it was really tight. But she was trying to get him not to go. And we learned that he injured his, his back five years prior to this. So then 10 years ago, he injured the back. And so his wife, you know, doesn't want him to go, but he says that, you know, he won't be gone long. He promised, but, you know, she was looking like she didn't heard this before. So he leaves the apartment and then he goes down several, I can't remember if he went down several floors or went up several floors, but he went to another apartment that was inside the same building that they live in. And so the apartment was empty except for, I think it was a sleeping bag, a lantern, and then this portable gas 
heater. And I'm assuming it was a gas heater because it had flames coming up. So he sits down next to the heater and he takes out some pain pills and a bottle of booze. And we know that that is a deadly mix because he's drinking and taking the oxycodone. So he falls asleep and then he wakes up, you know, and then realizes that he's been gone all night. So then when he jumps up and walks out of the apartment, he doesn't turn the heater off. And didn't, I don't even think he turned the lantern off and the sleeping bag was like really close to the heater. So he goes back upstairs and the wife has fallen asleep on the sofa. So of course she wakes up and the two of them get to arguing and everything. And then she lets him know that she knows that he's relapsed again. And then he finally admits that a few months earlier that he fell and hurt his back again, but he didn't want to tell her because evidently he's been in and out of rehab because of the addiction to the pain pills and the alcohol. And so, you know, he pleads with her that he's going to get himself together. He'll even go back to rehab if he has to. But the wife is like, you know, eventually I'm going to forgive you. I already know that. But right now, I just need you to leave and go somewhere else, you know, to go to sleep or whatever you got to do. But I want you out of here. So he goes back to the apartment, but he realizes that he left his keys on the counter at his apartment and he didn't want to go back to his apartment so he goes up on the roof and so he sits down on the roof and then he pulled out a flask so when he was in the other apartment he actually had a bottle of liquor so now he's walking around with a flask so he drinks the alcohol out of the flask and falls asleep and then all of a sudden he hear you know we get the 911 what's your emergency but it was somebody calling to report a fire so he hears the sirens and he wakes up and he realizes that it's his building that's on fire. So then he goes inside and he, the, air, the hallway was on fire. And then there was this guy running out of a hallway who was on fire. And then Bobby stops him, throws him down to the ground and get the fire, you know, put the fire out that was on his back. And so the guy was like, you know, don't leave me, don't leave me, help me get out of here. And he said, stay right here, don't move. Now keep in mind, the hallway on fire. <laughs> but he tell the man, don't go anywhere, just stay right there. He had to go get his family and he'd be right back. So he goes, and I mean, like the fire was burning through the walls and everything. And so he kicks the door in, but it's like, he was getting ready to kick the door in and the floor collapsed beneath him like it had did at the Indian wedding. And so he dropped down to the next floor and there were some firefighters there. And so they get him and they tell him, you know, you got to get out of the building. You got to get out of the building. And so he said, no, I got to save my family. And they're like, we'll take care of your family, but you got to get out of here. And then they like physically remove him out of the building. And so the family, of course, ended up dying. Like, I think that he said 148 people died in the, in the apartment complex. And remember when Bobby found, not Bobby, when Buck found his book that he was reading all the time and always writing in, he said, you saved 40 something people, but there was room for 148 people. Like what was significant about that number? So now we know the 148 was significant in that that's how many people died in the apartment fire with his family. So maybe his restitution in his mind is that once he saves 148 people, then he will have redeemed himself, you know, for what happened to his family. So we're back at the church, you know, back in the current times that he's talking to the priest. And the priest tells him that, you know, if he considers Henrietta and Buck and Chimney and all of them his friends, then he should be able to tell them the truth. And if he can't tell them the truth, then they really aren't his friends and he's just fooling himself. So then we get a final call that comes in on this episode. And so a guy has gotten um, into an automatic car wash. Like he was doing something in the car wash and somehow he, you know how the rollers are spinning around and the fabric stuff is... Um, wiping off the car was well, somehow he had a hose like a water hose and the hose got caught in that and then wrapped him around and he got wrapped around with the hose and so after they free the guy and get him off and take him on to the hospital they go back inside so buck was watching the surveillance footage and he was like cracking up and so the car wash owner was standing there and he was looking at him like dang are y'all supposed to be laughing at you know this just happened to the man and so they was trying to tell buck you know it's not funny you're being inappropriate but then eventually all of them start to laugh 
and realized you know, that it really was funny. So then after they leave out of there, Bobby tells Henrietta, you know, that he wants to open up and talk to them, but he wanted everybody to be together and bike at the fire station. So they agree that they're going to get together and he can tell his truth. Oh, so we also found out, I don't know how I forgot this part, was that the reason he was so angry with the guy who owned the building where the Indian wedding was is because the guy who owned the apartment complex where his family died, he had built that building with subpar material and it was material that had been banned. And it kind of reminds you of, you guys remember in England last year where they had that um, apartment complex caught on fire and they were talking about the material that the building was made out of and that it was just, a uh, um, oh God, what do they call it when the, the material is flammable? Um, I can't think of the term, but anyways, where once it catches on fire, the fire just spreads so quickly and there's nothing that you can really do about it. So it was a situation like that. And the reason he got away with it and nobody knows like his involvement is because the guy who owned the building promised not to report that he was renting that other apartment and that's where the fire started with and then Buck in exchange was able to just walk away and start a new life somewhere else and the deaths of his family and the fact that he started the fire never came back on him. So the show ended <laughs> with Buck calling Abby trying to have some phone sex. <laughs> I was like boy don't take your butt to bed but Abby you know she seemed to be tickled by it but I'm like that y'all just going too far and we don't want to see y'all together <laughs> we don't want this to be happening at all but like I said um Buck is turned on by Abby um she's a challenge because he probably has never met a woman that he couldn't get in the bed and so now it's on to see if he can get Abby in the bed and I just believing that once he hit it, he gonna quit it and Abby's gonna be devastated. So guys, that's it for me. Let me know what you thought about this episode. Leave your comments below. Let me know if I forgot anything. Rate the video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And until the next time, I shall talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.